Hello, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Uh, feels like it's been a while since I filmed one of these. I've just been um, busy with a lot of projects in the end of the uh, work school year. So today I have a different piece of paper. I usually use the Stonehenge Aqua 140 pound cold press. And I lament that they don't make it in um, different uh, tints or tones. But Legion does make Stonehenge, the paper, 90 pound in a different tints. So I have a quarter sheet of one of those. Uh, I just wanted to play around on it and see how the 90 pound played around. I don't know if it's treated any different than the 140 pound and the one labeled um, for aqua, but uh, we'll guess we'll see from there. While I coat it, things that we're going to look for is buckling, see how it scrapes, um, just look for issues like that. This one, I'm not sure what tint it is. Most likely it's tinted cream, but I had ordered some different ones from Blick and um, unfortunately the warm, the cream, the tan, it's a little difficult to distinguish in person and figure out which one is which because they're not labeled. Um, but the difference is obvious whenever you have a white piece of paper next to it and see that this one has a tone to it. It could be the natural, I'm not sure. So we'll look at this from a standpoint of how the 90 pound, 100% cotton handles. I think historically this came out in the 1970s as an option for um, printmakers listing on the Legion website. It's recommended for uh, printmaking, drawing, charcoal, um, a lot of just, you know, the, the common stuff, but it does list watercolor on there. So we'll see. I do believe that I have a sketchbook of the Legion watercolor paper, uh, sorry, the Legion paper, but it was merely just um, kind of sketches. It wasn't clamped down. So I really don't want that to um, have any bias on this. I do see some buckling take place, but I will mention that people do use 90 pound watercolor paper. And since we're working fast and loose, I would guess that this would be the application for it. Today I'm gonna to use the uh, sepia from Windsor Newton. This is the artist line. It is a combination of the PBK, I can't tell if it's a five or six, it's printed kind of small. So that's your black and PR 101, which is your light red oxide, I think, um, maybe your burnt sienna. So you could play around with their approach approach to sepia by mixing a black and a, um, a rust red. All right. So I use the back of the handle of the brush to flatten things out just because I don't want the oils from my skin to get onto the paper that usually creates areas of resist. So I apologize for the long introduction and the setup but I wanted to discuss all those things. And of course, uh, sepia, sepia is gonna be different from uh, brand to brand. This one just is looking uh, blacker and darker. So with my approach, I take a, a mixture of the Ron Ranson approach where um, I start out wet and wet, but I stay in the wet and wet phase a lot longer than um, people like Stephen Cronin, uh, Dennis Sheehan, uh, David Usher, etc. I kind of adopted a style based off of the modern tonalist painters, uh, Stuart Davies and um, Dennis Sheehan. And with them, they take their oils, they kind of thin them out, 
and they wipe it on, wipe it off in broad strokes and te texture strokes and just have a lot of fun with it. And that LUT works really well with watercolor. The main thing we want to watch out for is um, just if things are going to stain the paper, if it's not going to let us wipe back completely. The paper does seem to be drying at a faster rate than the 140 pound. So I'm going to make note of that. I do have a spray bottle right here. I think just giving it an extra, extra spritz, even though it's going to affect what I put in so far, this is going to give me a very soupy layer to work with. So this is definitely wetter than I usually work, but I think that's going to be one of the potential solutions if we find this paper to be viable. You can see that I've stretched it out quite a few times compared to my normal stretching. But I want it to go in, I want it to flow. I want my scene to create itself. I'm most likely going to create a scene that I've done before, uh, most likely due to just subconsciously reaching for that. However, I've been looking through um, what's called the Claude Lorraine album. It's a collection of drawings from Claude Lorraine, uh, one of the masters and I don't know if you'd say fathers or grandfathers of landscape painting. I've also been working on expanding my compositional vocabulary and exploring just just different compositions creating different ones um, working with either fountain pens dip pens um, colored pencils and just having a lot of fun uh, sketching ideas put that in and wipe out Harrison, be nice. Harrison um, kind of hisses at the other cats. He's um, a little fussy, but I can understand. You just want to be left alone hanging out, right, Harrison? You see that it lifts relatively well and it stamps back in. This is um, the blue shop rag. You can get it in the automotive section of um, stores. Though I do want to point out, I was looking for etching supplies for the dry point um, and working with the copper um, and doing the printing. And those websites had that same brand, the shop rag, the blue one, uh, for sale as one of their <laughs> supplies. So I find that very interesting that this type of towel, even though you don't see it often in watercolor supplies, you see maybe just a common watercolor brand, um, paper towel brand, this will show up in um, your printmaking brands. So that's that's pretty entertaining and interesting. So a few thoughts so far. Um, I did have to essentially super soak the paper. I am struggling with keeping my paper flat it's one of the things I really like about the Stonehenge Aqua is that it flattens really well and um, stretches really well and doesn't give me issues. This one being a lighter paper, 
don't know if that's the reason why it is causing some issues as well as that advanced drying. I do have other colors of this paper, other tones, tints. So this won't be the only video with it. Part of it might be, and this isn't me being like a fanboy of Legion, I, I genuinely enjoy their products. Um, not like sponsored or anything. But a part of me thinks that you know, just just playing with the different tones, just seeing what happens um, might be the way to go. And then through that, playing with the different tones, getting used to the composition of the paper, and then seeing what happens from there. That's um, kind of one of the things in like these experiments, working with the, the sepia from this brand would be to learn your materials and see how it acts, see how the tonal shift um, takes place. Scraping, it feels a little aggressive on it. And if you follow the watercolors that I mentioned earlier, um, Stephen Cronin, David Usher. I don't know if Alan Owen scrapes that much. But they're very, very good at scraping into their paper. And it may just be a, a symptom of practicing with that paper over and over again. talk about scraping a little bit more and I'm going to use this to kind of direct, direct a little ideas just kind of see how I want the composition to unfold maybe force an S shape in here I'm going to lift back and forth but with the scraping one of the key things is learning just how the different moisture levels affects the paper and what type of scrapes you're going to get here um, it's still moist. It's going to damage the paper. It's going to backfill. Here we have some wide openings, so it probably wasn't as damp right there. So we can get a variety. Let's see if I could open up something wide enough. So that's a hard press on the round edge of a card. Let's see. I'm just kind of, um, kind of just picking around a little bit, just seeing what we can do. I may have to just create more in the, the dry stage than I usually do. But I will put out a fresh glob. We'll darken some values. One of the things that I anticipate with this paint, and I've used it before, I just haven't used it frequently, so I'm not familiar with the tube itself, but I can tell you right now there's gonna be splotchiness due to the um, black pigment in it. I always find with um, heavy, wet and wet, and with applying a black pigment in this fashion, that it'll kind of leave a blotch when it dries. And we'll look for that whenever we dry it off. All right. I think I'm gonna cut in a foreground in here. There we go. Let's go here to here. a bend so it kind of looks like mush but let's dry it off and we'll see where we're at all right 
with feeling at the back of the hand, some areas feel a little cold. I mean, it's still a little damp, but some areas feel a little dry. Let's just hold this paper next to it, just so you can see the tone of our um, paper underneath and how it's playing a part against a white. Um, and you can see that here as well. And does that show up good? Yeah, that does. So that part I'm enjoying. Um, you can see in here where I was struggling with the scraping, where I felt like it wasn't getting clean scrapes and kind of damaging the paper. Here, my scrapes uh, just backfilled. And whenever you have a tonal shift, meaning things are lighting, softening as they dry, you will maintain a dark spot in there, which you can use to your advantage, um, especially if you're to scrape in the foreground and you want it to get a wide tonal range and you're just working with one um, tube of paint. You can kind of use that as a trick to get your darks. Um, here you can see some of the splotchiness of the black pigment settling out um, compared to the PR 101, whether that's the burnt sienna or a light red oxide, I'm not sure. But you can see some of that taking place, but not too bad. But overall, with this, that's some of the issues. Um, you can see uh, these kind of trees seem to be floating because they're not grounded in place. So let's put out some fresh paint. I think I mentioned earlier I was going to, is that this approach will go through a lot of pigment just because we're using fresh paint with it. Um, to reference Ron Ranson and uh, just kind of artists in general, there's a recommendation to go with cheaper paints, uh, especially for beginners. And this is not meaning that you get like the, the cheapest paints on the market where it's just um, a dollar for all the paints. This is your student line, your Cotman brand, your Van Gogh brand. Um, I think White Knights in Europe is considered a a student line. Reason being is with a student line you're going to pay less than an artist line and when you do that you then are you kind of less frugal with your paint meaning you pour out more paint on the palette you're not worried about wasting any um, it lets you really just explore and have fun. I guess an analogy would be, and I'm not a golfer, so let me know if this is a good analogy. Let's say you go to the driving range, or you're going to play golf or practice, and you bring five balls with you. You know, you go, you buy balls there, you buy the expensive ones, you buy five of them, so you get five practice shots. You really have to make those practice shots count. Because even if you don't play golf, you could just imagine five swings and you're done. But let's say they had a cheaper ball brand where you can get, I don't know, 20 for that whatever amount of money. Um, and that lets you just kind of get the 20 practices out of it. And you're not really worried too much about the money that you put in per ball. So think about that with terms of um, milliliters of uh, paint. With the Windsor Newton, Daniel Smith, those paints are your Panda Premium. They're expensive. And you're gonna most likely feel, unless you know you're, you have a lot of cash money, you're probably gonna be you know conservative, be frugal with it. But with a student line, you can put out some fresh paint, you can really play around. Now me personally, I've gotten to the point where I have some expensive paints. I 
don't purposely, well, I guess I do purposely buy some expensive paints, like the um, Daniel Smith brand, just simply to play around with their earth pigments because it has some attributes that I want to explore. This um, sepia I had bought from Hobby Lobby when they used to have the 40% off coupon and I really just didn't know what I was buying and what to buy. So over time you'll wind up amassing different tubes of paint of various qualities. But if you simply got a huge tube of um, Cotman, um, I think Cotman makes a sepia, and if, even if they don't, if you just got their black and a brown and mixed it together, or just use their brown, or just use their black, and just put pigment to paper, paint, you know, and just paint, paint, paint. That's the important thing. Sometimes we get caught up in watching different videos, reading different books, looking different things, but um, at the end of the day, use these things to inspire you. Maybe just take one or two key points away to explore. You're welcome to follow along with these videos. Um, and of course, you're welcome to obviously go to the channels that I mentioned, the other painters, um, Stephen Cronin, and David Usher, you know, see what they're doing. And use them to get inspired, you know, try things out. But at the end of the day, just um, create and explore. And eventually you get to a point where you're going to have a large pile of paintings. And then from there, turn that pile over and start painting on the back. You can, of course, um, cut them down to sizes, um, look for little compositions within that. In fact, I had the honor of being a part of one of Stuart Davies' uh, Zoom meetings. And he had mentioned that where I think he had looked at a painting that he had done and shown in either Photoshop or whatever editor he was using. He could put just four little dots to zoom in on a spot and just think of that composition. All right, so I apologize. I do feel like I'm a little all over the place today. I think I did mention in the beginning, it did feel like it's been a while since I did one of these, or at least thought that, just because the, um, the work year has been coming to a close. But there's gonna be so much painting taking place. And I'm, Super excited about that. To go back to the paper itself, the dry brush stage, what I'm doing right now, just kind of um, putting texture in, exploring, it's working really well. The paper is, I haven't tried scraping into this. I can see if there's an area, there we go. You could scrape in this stage as well. You could just throw a whole bunch of marks and really kind of play around in there. But that doesn't really suffer. So what I'm thinking is, and once again, I apologize for the, uh, the lack of brevity in this video, how it's just really um, a lot of stopping and talking. The 90 pound paper is probably just drying at a quicker rate than the 140 pound. Um, I'm not a paper scientist. I'm just wondering if that's the case. But the benefit would be that 
in this stage where if you watch um, Stephen Cronin and if you watch my other videos where painting in the stage you can create pools of water which then create a wet and wet spot um, and kind of start losing texture and you start swirling things around again if it's drying quicker you're not having to pause and do a dry off so that might be an on-scene benefit but for me I have some of the most fun in the wet and wet stage so as we go through these different sheets and I bought these sheets for um, like I said, the, the printing process that I've been working with, um, the, the etchings, and um, using them for drawings and sketches. But if I can get some sense of uh, a feeling that I, that I enjoy out of it, watercolor then that'll be something that takes place but let me do a complete dry off and we'll see what it's looking like all right so before we continue I'm going to add another element in I do want to just quickly give a huge thank you to the people that support this channel um, down below I have the patreon and I really appreciate everybody that supports through that those of you that like, comment, and subscribe, that really helps this channel out as well. So um, if you would like this, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, please comment. And if you want to support financially, I do have the link down below. All right, so that being said, I want to throw tree mass in here. I'm using the number four rigger. I use this because I can get a very calligraphy type stroke with it and it holds more pigment than the number uh, one rigger which I was using earlier. You'll find there's people that use a brush for everything, a different type of brush. Um, I don't know who it was, but I remember some art professor telling me, telling us how one painter would drop his brush between each stroke and just leave it by his feet. And that was for his apprentice um, to pick up and clean up. Um, who that is, I don't know. If you know, let me know in the comments below. It's probably just some obscure art history thing. But, You'll find that you wind up using um, a certain set of tools over and over again. Like I have, I don't want to use settled for what what color I use, uh, paper I use, but I found one that I like and what works for me. And you're gonna find what brushes work for you. Now, I use the Hake brush, and a lot of people really love it. Um, a lot of people search for videos, and I need to make another one on how to use the Hake brush. Just to kind of put that information out there and help people. There is one that I put out comparing Hake brushes, um, and I know that a lot of the other gentlemen and women out there that film have put videos out on the hate brush itself but you might find that that's not for you and if that is the case that that's perfectly fine the whole point of this is exploration and seeing what you like to do the number one for me since I don't have a super light hand helps put in the smaller branches and I'll probably even grab the hake, which 
I'll just say outright, we all mispronounce the hake brush. It's supposed to be hake, like sake, but um, it's kind of become a part of our dialect in the terms of it being the, the hake brush. Um, I believe it's Japanese origin. However, a lot of the, um, the Japanese painting arts came from um, the Chinese. So there's always uh, influence from one art to the other uh, taking place. And speaking of uh, Japanese art, that used, played a huge influence on Van Gogh, on Whistler, on the painters of the 1800s. So, art is kind of a great way to think about, like, just if you wanted to transcend boundaries. I think there's even videos and documentaries and arguments that art has been used to um, fight culture wars from the standpoint of um, America versus, I don't know, uh, versus Russia, where we had the expressionism taking place, the loose, expressive, free feel, which embodied the American spirit. And then you had the art in um, Soviet Russia, which was very, I don't know if the language is stoic, uh, very upright, very um, working class. Um, so there's a lot of things with art, how it's been used politically as satire, as um, to bring cultures together, to expose people to other cultures. I don't like how that's just sitting back there, so I'm kind of doing another layer in front, bringing that across. I want a little bit back here. This has been a very random video, I apologize. I don't know if I mentioned it's Friday. Second to last Friday of work. Came home, took a fantastic nap. And I feel bad. My buddy said, texted me and said he was going to take a nap. He was done mowing. And I was like, oh man, did we have plans to hang out? I'm not sure. But I'm actually working on a, an oyster series for his outdoor kitchen. And I'm going to film some of that. I coated some canvas that he picked up in watercolor ground. So that's going to be really fun for us to explore. And I do have a potential opportunity, a connection that I made yesterday, to have a exhibit in town. And I think I'm going to take part in, or I don't, I don't know the correct language for it, um, but there is a Arts Council in the area, and um, I don't know what role I'll play, a volunteer or just you know somebody helping events or what. But I went to a meeting for that yesterday. It just feels like the next natural growth in painting. It's funny as you get older. And I'm in my mid to late 30s, how you start taking on different roles in the community. As you know, I'm a school teacher. Um, I used to be heavily involved with coaching powerlifting to the point we had a national championship powerlifting team. Um, I feel like I've done quite a bit 
not not trying to brag or anything like that, but when you sit back and look, at what you've done, you start realizing all these things start taking place. Right now, I'm just kind of expending the last of the pigment that I have out. This probably goes back to what I had said earlier about uh, the frugality when you use an expensive uh, line of paint and kind of really kicked up the rambling gear. So I'm gonna use these last few minutes. We'll do a dry off and we'll see. And of course, you are welcome to follow along and sign your own name to it. You have my express permission to sign your own name to anything you do when you follow along with these. And my express permission to sell anything you do when you follow along. I want you guys to be successful, have fun, and just have money for art supplies. And if you do, feel free to tag me. I would love to see what you, um, what you wind up uh, doing. And whenever somebody does, I absolutely love that. It really makes my day. So that's probably, probably the biggest thank you anybody could ever give is simply uh, tagging me in something that they followed along with. Another video that I want to touch on and you might have seen me making some kind of gestures before I started drawing. Looking at the Claude Lorraine album, it's since it's a combination of drawings and sketchings and preps for paintings, I did notice grid lines and other things. Now historically, for me, I've seen grid lines used whenever people are drawing or painting something and they're going hyper realistic. I've also seen grid lines for the rule of thirds where at the third intersection of each spot is where the point of interest might be. And then I have seen people talk about that with um, the golden ratio. So I saw some different lines on his drawings and I was trying to look it up and I stumbled across this thing called um, armature. And the armature, kind of a system of lines, kind of uh, perspective lines, I guess, that you don't use every single one of them, but you can use them to kind of get a direction and a flow of a composition. And it took me a while, it took me some videos online to really understand what was taking place. But I saw it applied in detail to a Vermeer painting and I was like, wow, okay, there's no way that this is coincidence. And it's something that I've been trying to do with my sketching. And here I was just doing kind of guesstimates where some of those things would sit and um, that's something I kind of want to do a video on very soon. But I'll probably do the video and then direct you to uh, the gentleman that I've been watching who explains it in better detail. And maybe hearing two different or three different voices on it might make sense. Because I... It looked very intimidating at first. I was like, what are all these lines and how are they used? Let's do a dry off. All right, so it feels pretty dry. Um, I'm quite pleased with this one. Uh, once again, this was the Windsor Newton. This isn't signing well. Uh, the Windsor and Newton sepia, sepia, which is a combination of a black and the PR one zero one. I'm probably going to write that on the back of this. I would mentioned that I might have an exhibition take place and I think one of the things would be a palette exploration just kind of talking about the the earth tones and my exploration there. So I'm gonna write that on the back. But that being said the paper itself 
in the wet and wet stage, I did feel a little uncertain about it. I did have to stretch it out more than I wanted to and um, did not really quite enjoy that. But having the toned paper, it really does feel like it gives a vibe to this. So I'm gonna go through the different 90 pound um, Stonehenge paper in future videos and we'll see if we can get used to that. And then from there, uh, see what takes place just with the tones themselves. But that being said, in the dry off stage, it handled really well. So if you were somebody who wasn't super soaking in the paper and just painting on top of it, it might be a really good go-to paper just to begin with. So we'll see. I hope you enjoyed. Let me know what you think down below. What's your paper, favorite paper? Let me know down below. And um, I will talk to you all soon. Have a great day.